time for Ball Talk with Sanford and Johnny. From what's happening on the blue at Boise State to the Mountain West and beyond. The biggest storylines, the best guests, and most outlandish opinions from two dudes who eat, sleep, and breathe college football. Today's broadcast is coming from the Cutwater Spirits Can Cocktail Studios. Check out one of their more than 30 flavors of pre-mixed premium cocktails at your local gas station or grocery store. Cutwater Can Cocktails is perfect for your next game day tailgate party. Ball Talk with Sanford and Johnny, featuring former Boise State quarterback and longtime coach Mike Sanford and KTIK 95.3 FM, the tickets, Johnny Mallory on Bronco Nation News. Ball Talk Spring Edition, Episode 3. I'm Johnny. There's Mike Sanford, the Sandman on a Giants Dodgers Monday night. They're 10 minutes from the first pitch. This is the dedication that BJ Reigns demands. We got Mike Sanford with us. Coach, uh, going to be a fun hour here, and uh, we'll get you to your game. I know you're a baseball guy. A little bit of a baseball guy, but uh, here we are again, man, in uh, practice seven for the Boise State Broncos tomorrow. Yep. On the blue, I, I think the first uh, practice on the blue was that Saturday, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, or was I, it Friday? Yeah, at least open to the media. I think Saturday okay. was the first practice there. They were flying yeah, around. The time, yeah, I think it's the first time that they practiced on the blue from what I've heard and seen. Uh, and I'll tell you this, that is a great feeling. Uh, when you've been in an indoor facility, and as nice as these indoor practice facilities are, there are times where you just want to be outside. You want to be in your home environment. And it does feel really good to step on out on that blue. And there's nothing like it. There truly isn't. And uh, back in the days when when I was playing, there were no grass fields. You guys, there was yeah. no indoor practice field. There was no – it was the blue. And it was AstroTurf. Uh, and I so, remember, yeah, it was frozen some days that we practiced uh, out there in spring ball. I remember Hawk on uh, mainly KTIK back in the day just politicking for that indoor, saying how <laughs> – Hey, you want a big time football team? We can't be practicing outside on spring ball. Hawk got that done. The Kevin Williams, I mean, still, I mean, heck, that's over 15 or so years old. And it's still, I mean, it's a little dark it's a sometimes. Mahal. It's a but, Taj yeah. Mahal, though. It is beautiful. You know, and and uh, kudos to Thunder Dan Hawkins for for getting that that politicking done as as an Idaho Vandal and Johnny Mallory would say. Mm. Uh, but yeah, you need to get it. I mean, when you don't have your only facility in your entire athletics department is your basketball arena, your football stadium, your indoor facility, your weight room as the, what is it? The ASUI Kibbe Dome. It was. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, bit. this is, that's a long time ago, Sandman. <laughs> you guys got new facilities? You got new yeah, we got the best arena in the big sky in the Kibbe Dome. Since you've been in it has had a few pretty big upgrades. I'm Ooh. serious. The translucent wall. It's the best place to watch. And There's FBS, a translucent FCS. Wall. I love it. My man. goodness. You, you, hey. you can't, you can't resist. I mean, I hope the Dodgers just freaking smack the giants tonight, man. Well, <laughs> based off the payroll, they should. You know, based off of yeah. what they've done in the offseason, why okay. even play the games? Because yeah. the Dodgers, yeah. ESPN's coronated them, MLB Network's coronated them. So, yeah, why even play the games? Why? Well, there's only 158 to go. So, well, yeah, just don't play them. Just let the Dodgers go get their, their first meaningful world championship mm. in a non-pandemic year <laughs> yeah. since 1988. How old were you in 1988 the last time that the Doyers – won a real ring, a real Dude, beautiful full season championship ring. I love how giant fans hold that over for Dodger fans. They like they take away their title. They, they it doesn't weigh as much as a full 162 game title. That's good. That's good stuff to have on Dodger fans. Why are you such a passionate baseball fan? Where'd that come from? Well, it came from my dad. My dad grew up in the Bay Area, and then uh, he took me out of school one day on a recruiting trip. And took me to my first San Francisco Giants game at Candlestick Park. And so I, I went to a game. I, he showed me where he grew up, which was about 20 miles from, from where the, the Giants played back then at Candlestick Park. And I just I caught the vision of what my dad grew up doing 
going to Giants baseball games, and I just I became a diehard fan. And then I think also Johnny with all the different moves, and, and even a dad that coached college football at so many places, then coached in the National Football League for the Chargers when they were in San Diego. I didn't have a chance to really have a hometown period, let alone a hometown team. And so I became an NFL fan, you know, heavily when my dad was at the Chargers. Yeah. Well, you know, three years later, they fired Mike Riley and my dad and the entire staff. So I didn't like the Chargers after that. So <laughs> it's taken a while to find my favorite teams. And uh, baseball has always been one that is in a slower season that I can catch some games. You know, it's really hard to catch games in any of the other major sports uh, when you're coaching college football. So uh, the Giants has always been my my true hobby and probably the only, definitely the only team outside of my alma mater that I just consider like that's blood. San Francisco Giants is my professional sports team. I love it, man. Let's, let's see who else, any other baseball fans watching this, just text in the chat, type in the chat, who your favorite MLB team is, man. We'll see if we get another, any other giant fans. We got some, we got some Orioles fans. They're living that good life right here. Oh, <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Your guy, your Idaho Vandal there. Of course he's a Dodgers fan. Uh, so yeah, that makes sense. Uh, the BJ Reigns Stan account is a, is a St. Louis Cardinals fan. So yeah, there's there's uh, here, here we go more Dodgers fans. So yeah, uh, you know what? I still have uh, big game Bob Beeler on my side. I know he's oh a yeah, hard. I guarantee you, Bob's not fan. watching ball talk tonight. I can promise yeah. you that. If he was a if he was a real media member in the Boise market, he would have his priorities straight and wa be watching what I think is the greatest show in the history of Colorado slash Idaho yeah. uh, online Easily. podcasting by far. Easily. I mean, the combination, it, it, it's just a great collaboration. Yeah. So. I mean, the, the, the data will back that as well. Um, I want to start ball talk tonight on the blue. Well, maybe I'll get back to that. You said something about just being a player at Boise state, even if it's practice, just being on the blue, like it, it does. It just it just means something different. So maybe we'll come back to that because I do want to talk. Matt Lauder, the tight end, Sanford, he's having a spring, dude. He looks bigger. He looks faster. He looks stronger. I was at the entire practice on Saturday right there on the sidelines, and they ran a lot of ones versus ones, twos versus twos. I mean, about as physical as you want it to get, right, in spring ball. And Louder was all over the place. Catches, he's a monster in the running game. Uh, behind him is probably where the discussion should begin. But, I mean, you had a little chance to see Louder. I know you watched Boise State last year. I think they got high expectations for this Louder kid. And it looks to me, man, I haven't seen a tight end kind of fill out the uniform like that since mm -hmm. John Bates. He just looks the part this year. I'm really excited about Matt Louder. There's a tradition and a legacy of tight ends at this university that are uh, phenomenal. I mean, just I, I think about how that position's been utilized. Uh, the the tight end position is the position I think like it even it fills in the blanks that lead to the creativity of the offense, and not just one tight end, not just two tight ends, but even three or four that are utilized in a rotation are used in personnel groupings. And I think that Matt Louder just watching his semi small body of work in 2023 but it grew as the year progressed it grew even more i think when spencer danielson uh took over as the head coach you think about the utah state game multiple touchdown performance by my mount louder and i you mentioned it to me johnny watching him at practice uh the way that he's he's built six four six five uh he fills out the uniform i like his lower half i know it sounds weird for a man to talking about another man's lower half but in football it's what we do we got to break down the lower half. And I so love I, Ashton Genty's lower half. I really do. I don't think anybody in Boise does dislikes that that <laughs> that engine, that caboose that can and continues to do so, even if it snow plowing through a semi non existent snow year up in Boise, if I'm not mistaken. He's, I, he's good, man. Yeah. But I, I'd say this about louder. Yeah. I think that the, the getting him involved in every aspect, run game, pass game, uh, and then, you know, be able to utilize him. Uh, you know, as as that outlet, uh, you think about when you watch the NFL, the position of tight end has become the in vogue position. I go yeah. back to the NFC Championship game and the AFC Championship game. Let's play a little game here, Johnny. I love it. Tell me the 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 big name tight ends on the AFC Championship game side of things between the Ravens and 
excuse me. Yeah, the Ravens and the Chiefs. Okay. Um, well, the Ravens, I, I like what they do at tight end. Mark, Mark Andrews, Andrews. And then think and, about the, the young Bucks. I, I love Isaiah Likely. Oh, my that kid is That kid has everything you want in this in vogue tight end. Yeah. And then you look at the Chiefs, and they got a guy who's a clear, clear first ballot Hall of Famer. So, yeah, if you look at the AFC, yeah, good tight end play from the teams that uh, were playing for the championship there. Okay, and then let's talk about the NFC Championship game. Look at look at the two teams that squared off in the NFC Championship game, starting with uh, your San Francisco 49ers, and there's two of them. Yeah, uh, another Iowa kid, right? Uh, George Kittle, uh, such a beast there with the Niners. There's a guy who's going to get Hall of Fame consideration if he continues two, three more years of a Pro Bowl caliber year like Kittle has provided, and I don't know why he wouldn't in that offense and then Sam Laporta. I mean, was there a better rookie tight end oh. since Mike Ditka than Sam Laporta? I don't think there was, and I think the data will back that. I mean, tight ends don't break through and have rookie years like that. It takes a while at that position, and you're going to probably break that down a little later. But, yeah, the way Laporta played last year. So, I guess, okay, that's going to – I'll back your argument there that, okay, if you got a good tight end, if you're good at that position, it's going to help you for sure. And I, I'd go further to say that nowadays in today's National Football League, and I think it corresponds clearly to the college game, if you have not just a good or a sufficient tight end, you have an elite tight end, your odds of doing something extraordinary, as in in the NFL, going to an AFC-NFC championship game into the Super Bowl. But if you're looking at Boise State, if you have an elite tight end that breaks through, you're looking at a chance to be the playoff buster. As, as the non, whatever they call them now, power two. I, I don't, I mean, there really aren't two conferences that matter anymore. Uh, the power Sadly. two, it, it's the Big Ten and the SEC, and everything else is kind of like, eh, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll give them a couple spots at the, yeah. at the maybe table we'll beat you in the playoffs, you know, but yeah, but, the, yeah the, the money, the money disparency. It's, 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 yeah, it's and so I think this position is incredibly important for, for this spring. And obviously, the confidence. In whoever ends up starting at quarterback behind center for Boise State, the confidence in that connection or those connections, if it ends up being one or two quarterbacks throughout it, throughout the course of the year, I don't think we're going to see two quarterbacks playing in the same, you know, at the same games, running them in and out again. But if you do see, uh, you know, you want to look for that growth uh, between whoever starts at quarterback in their tight end, knowing that you always have an outlet knowing that you have a big target over the middle. And that's such a big thing in this draft, Johnny. When you yeah. hear all these quarterbacks getting broken down, you even like the NFL, like Russell Wilson didn't fit Sean Payton's Denver Broncos system because he doesn't love to throw over the middle. And I've heard the same thing about Michael Penix Jr., that he's charted as not being as favorable throwing the ball over the middle of the field. And that's such a big thing for the quarterback position. And I think even more so if your quarterback is a little bit taller, a little bit longer, you 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 see that there's more correlation with tight end completions in your on schedule playmaking, throwing those ten to twelve yard basic crosses, which are basically uh, shallow. You know, they're 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 intermediate dig cuts for a tight end. Um, you have those ten yard sit routes, those five yard sit routes. You know all the all the vertical routes that you can throw off play action, just coming straight off the ear of a linebacker. I think that a taller quarterback a lot of times does have the propensity to to want to throw and feel comfortable with finding their tight end over the middle huh. of the field. And I think that's where Matt Lauder is going to come into play uh, for whoever starts at quarterback. You know, I've heard, uh, you know, Greg Olson has said this, and I, I trust Greg Olson's opinion when it comes to football and the tight end position, obviously. But he says outside of quarterback, it's it's the toughest position to learn and play, not only in the NFL, but in high-level college football you're nodding your head like you agree with them totally uh, elaborate dig deep why you've coached tight end well it, it's funny there's always a subculture of the tight end room that i've been a part of and a lot of times you do everything in your power to make the job as simple as you can on the receiver position and i'm talking about from how you call formations uh and and the more simple your formational system is actually it puts more on the tight end position and a lot of times their duties are and their formations is just line up to assign. So whatever your assignment is, uh, you just have to line up based off that where the receivers are getting very detailed, descriptive terms about where they need to line up in the receiver position. Uh, the tight ends have to learn the insides and outs of the run game, have to know it, 
have to understand when the center is pointing out an ID in the run game, how wow. that affects their, how that affects who they're blocking and where yeah. their combination wow. needs to go to. And then they work oftentimes with tackles. Like most of the power plays that are run in college football, it starts with the tackle and tight ends combination. Um, most people call that a tray block. And that starts at the tight end position. So you have to be completely dialed in to the run game. You also have to be dialed in, dialed in nowadays because everybody's running you know, a lot of the, the run action passes, which are hard run fakes that actually mirror the, the exactness of the run. Totally. And the, and the tight end is going to have to be asked to be a big-time pass protector. And so you have to sell the run on these run action passes. And then as that freak show defensive end, is transitioning from a run defender into a pass bit pass rusher. That's yeah. a hard job, man. And then the last thing you got to know all the pass game and you got to be able to line up in every single position. You know, there's times where I've asked tight ends to be the blocking running back on third down pass pro. You, used, yeah. Okay. I've used that in my career. We did that with, uh, uh, with Ryan Hewitt, who ended on to, um, at, he was at Stanford. He went on to be a starting H back in the NFL for the Bengals for several years. So, and then of course, the, all the different pass routes, you got to know exact details. So outside of maybe the quarterback who's asked to know so much about what the defensive structure is, asked to know about what affects the run game and how to either have the throws to protect the run game uh, relief throws, if you will. This guy adds to the box. I got to use this throw uh, to make sure that we don't have a, a bad look to run the ball on that particular call. Uh, the quarterback doesn't necessarily need to know everything from an identification perspective, who the center's pointing. Some offenses, the, the quarterback does direct that, but not most college offenses, the quarterback, you know, they, 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 they call the run play either in the huddle or they echo it at the line of scrimmage that came in from the offensive coordinator play call via signal or now I think via headphones or uh, headsets in their, in their helmet. Um, but really for that, it, it, it then goes to the center and then all five plus the tight ends. And, and so there's a lot of work. There's a lot of, that goes into developing the tight end position. And all those things that I just said, Johnny, and I know I went on a, a really a mic drop worthy uh, tight end discussion. All that being said, that subculture in the tight end position meeting room, they've called themselves in different groups I've been at around. Some of them called themselves the junkyard dogs. You know, nobody wants them. They're just kind of hanging out. Just And then I've even had a group that called themselves the bastards, you know, because they're just the bastard son that nobody wants to claim. You know, we'll just, you know, just, we'll be the, the smallest uh, team meeting room. Oh, yeah. You know, they all, seriously, like it's just like whatever. Okay, tight ends. I mean, I think when you started at Boise State, the tight end room was like underneath the bleachers on a racquetball court or something right. like that. I think I, you're I think right. Bart Hendricks said something to me like, "Our tight end room, we didn't have one. It was under the bleachers, yeah. <laughs> like some of the old days." Um, so you're telling me, so a tight end, and, and you think about this, like. Uh, you, you'll have to at times block the other team's best pass rusher. Yep. And you'll also at times have to get open against the other team's best pass defender. And sometimes you'll have to do that on back-to-back -back plays. And I never really thought about it, but yeah, if you're an attached tight end on the line and all of a sudden the center changes the call, you might have, Hey, I'm going to run a, just a quick in on this, or it's just going to be a quick, you know, just stop and check and, all of a sudden, they're telling me I have to stay in and block now. I mean, does that happen sometimes? Will the center say, tight end, you're staying in on this per the call? Like, how many times will a tight end line up thinking he's going to go uh, out for a pass and he's you know, obviously tr thinking about that, and then all of a sudden, oh, shit, never mind, now I got I to gotta pass block. Johnny, you bring up a great uh, question there. In, in the tight end position, you know, for the most part, if a, if a uh, pass call is called in the huddle, uh, they're going out on that pass. Okay. Sometimes there are some systems where the tight end is going to check number four, which would be a, like a, a nickel Sam. And if that nickel Sam comes, you know, they might have to do a quick check before they release. That's some uh, systems that I have seen in the past. It's kind of gone away from being in vogue. But then the biggest one is that uh, either the look system that's in place where everybody it has a play call and then there's a fake cadence you ready to say go. And then you see everybody look to the sideline. A lot of times the coordinator will lock down the tight end in pass protection because of a, a massive pressure look, cover zero, that type of deal. In NFL systems, 
the quarterback, he, oftentimes he'll just check the protection. So in the NFL, your base five-man protection O-line plus the running back makes you six-man pro. People call that two-jet or three-jet protection. So you'll call two-jet and you might call four verticals. So it's all yeah. goes special. And then if you see a cover zero look, you have a kill or a can to 58 protection. 58 protection locks down the tight end and then turns it into a full slide. And now the tight end has to hear, hey, can, 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 can. Well, that means the second play that was called in the huddle is includes 58 protection. And then a lot of times you'll see the quarterback then either signal out new routes or they'll let, let you know that we're good. Like we're going to keep the same route concept on minus the tight end. Why are they, why are you killing four verts when you see a zero coverage? Don't you want that in four verts? Okay. So let, great question, Johnny. Let's, let's do a little bit of math here. Okay. I mean, if we're playing Madden right, right now, zero. Okay. So just for context, yeah. Four verts to the, to the two slot receivers or tight end and slot receiver. The ideal completion spot is between 18 and 22 yards. That's where they have to win and then look for the football. Okay. On the outside, the go routes are typically converted or they're typically um, completed more like 28 to 36 yards down the field. That's the outside go routes. Okay. So if, if it's cover zero, how many deep safeties do you have? None. None. Okay. So, so if I you're, if you're releasing, no, I know if you're releasing four human beings. Okay. How many people are covering? On defense. I think it would be four. Yes. You get an A on your math exam today. <laughs> so First then, one I've ever had. With that being said, what are the other seven guys doing? Coming to put your quarterback on his back. All right. How many offensive linemen do you have? Five. How many running backs do you have? One. You're short. Yeah, but can't I mean no. we can't get enough time back there and sling. No, I mean, a free hitter. Those guys, like, have you looked at the the splits on the ten yard dashes when the NFL Combine tests the forty yard dash? You have a nickel, a nickel that's coming free off the edge. <laughs> okay. They run like yeah. one three ones in their ten yard splits. Totally. And then, like I said, you can't. You don't have the time now. You, there are side adjust routes that you can build in where you throw a quick slant. Those aren't as sexy. You want to be able to launch the football down the field. So you just get something in place to be able to push the ball down the field. With. So what are you, what are you calling? Um, again, you call all four verts. Everybody's going deep. You see that it's a, it's a, it's a cover zero and they're bringing everybody. It's man to man everywhere. What, what, what's in the Sandman's kind of bag well, of tricks? What did you well, like to go? I, I always like to max protect. Uh, I love max protecting, which means keep your tight end and your and your running back in in protection, even on like third and eight. Yeah, I mean absolutely okay. because you. I mean, in the pass game, it's always protection first, always. Okay, so I'll write that down. I, I love I love going with locking down the tight end, and the running back, and full gap, full slide protection. Get your appropriate routes. I love throwing a slot fade. I, I don't like, so I would, if to my two receiver side, whichever side it would be, if you're an 11 personnel, one tight end, one running back, and then three s split out wide receivers, I love to throw a slot fade to the inside receiver and yeah, then yeah. Out, outside run oh, like a wide release, the you know, diamond release slant just to have a come down throw. If you're getting jammed at the line of scrimmage. Now, yep. when you do do the, Hey, can, can, or, you, or the quarterback goes, Hey, easy black 58, black 58. Then you can you can throw a little extra little word in there, okay? Which would be yellow, okay? So black fifty eight, black fifty eight, yellow, yellow, yellow. So now you do full gap, full slide protection against cover zero. A lot of times in cover zero, the tight end has different rules whether he's going to block the guy head up over him or he's going to block out on maybe a nine technique, which would be just just directly outside of his alignment, meaning the tight end's alignment. Well, when he does that. Okay, he blocks the blitzer, the known blitzer. What do you think that the man that has him in coverage does once he sees the tight end block in pass protection? Is this part of the quiz? This is more football 500. So it's cover zero. I'm on defense. I'm not called in the blitz. 
Okay. But I have the tight end man to man. I see the tight end do what almost everybody does when it's cover zero. He stays in and pass protection. Mm. Right. So then I, I'm the guy that's got him in man coverage. Am I just going to sit there at three and a half, four yards and just pull my pud? No. What am I going to do once I see that tight end block? Spy the quarterback? I'm going to go knock the living crap out of the quarterback. Okay. After I realize that he's a pass protector. And then what do you think 58 yellow is? You block out 1,001, 1,002, and then you run the old delay slipper right down there. I floor. love that play. I love the tight end slip release. They, they come in as a blocker. They fool everybody. It's out of sight, out of mind for the defense. And then you get a tight end that just kind of tippy toes out there. You're like, okay, that, this is going to be a good gain. I got a next question. Um, We're talking tight end a lot on ball talk. We got a mic drop coming up as well um, here on ball talk. We're having fun tonight. We will see you in 90 seconds. All Bronco Nation news broadcasts come from the Cutwater Spirits canned cocktail studios. Check out one of their more than 30 flavors of premix premium cocktails at your local gas station or grocery store. Cutwater Spirits, perfect for your next game day tailgate party. Our title sponsor is RowPaint.com. For all your commercial, industrial, residential painting needs, check out RowPaint.com. Don't forget about their concrete coatings. Transform that ugly concrete slab on your back patio in your garage in just one day. Contact RowPaint.com for a free estimate today. The official paint and coatings company of Boise State Athletics and our title sponsor at Bronco Nation News is RowPaint.com. Idaho Central Credit Union has been helping members achieve financial success for more than 80 years. There's an ICCU branch on almost every corner, but the closest is in your pocket with free e-branch mobile and online banking. See why more than 500,000 members love ICCU and join one in four Idahoans by making the switch today at ICCU.com. Since 1984, Ridley's Family Markets has prided itself on being a hometown food and drug store that employed value members of the local community. Ridley's Family Markets has 13 locations in the state of Idaho and many more in the surrounding states. Download the new Ridley's app to your smartphone, get savings up to 40% off at the checkout line, and find a location near you at shopridleys.com. Former Bronco Matt Bauscher is once again the number one ranked realtor in the Treasure Valley. No home is too big or too small for Matt and his team. Let them fulfill all your real estate needs at BauscherRealEstate.com. All right, Sandman. Ball Talk, Spring Edition, Episode 3. Got about 30 minutes left on the clock tonight. I'm all Ashton Genty, right? I cannot wait to see what he does this year. I can't get my eyes off him at practice. Everybody, no, n- nor can anybody else, you know, and they have like, you know, there was some, there were some Boise celebrities hanging out on, on, on the sidelines on practice. Some of your old teammates, all that stuff. Johnny and, Mallory, uh, Johnny, the ball game, <laughs> Mallory. I was there. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, we haven't brought this up, Johnny. I want to get the skinny on. I want to see, I want to hear about how your vertical jump went at oh. pro day. Gosh, man, that was embarrassing, dude. I thought you did a pretty admirable job, man. And I, I would have, yeah, I, I wish I was younger, man. I could have put on a show. Maybe they would have invited me to run a 40, you know? No, the 40 would not have been good. But I will say you're more of a, a vertically explosive athlete than you are a dynamic, linear, exactly. chew up grass type of an athlete. Well, I was on a community college track and field team for a month. So okay. I do have, okay. a, and I competed in two meets, coach. So well, I do well, have some college. Where'd you go, man? Where, where, where's the? Yeah, Santa Barbara City College. Ooh, the the Vacanos. You were living that good life down there. I was, uh, yeah, too good a life. That's why I quit oh, the damn track man. team after a month. What am I doing oh. here? You know, I'm going to go hang out in Santa Barbara. But uh, no, it was awesome, dude. Like, Cutter was walking by, and he's like, hey, you didn't jump yet? And I'm like, no, I didn't jump. And he just kind of grabbed me and took me to the whole thing. And that dude. Cutter can 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 stop the room, right? I had NFL scouts there, not going there, waiting to see me jump. Like everybody was there, it was it was kind of embarrassing, but it was fun. And I, I think it was Frank Sinatra that said, "Dare to wear the foolish clown face." Hey, man, I, hey, you know what though? I've you put that. yourself in the you put yourself in the dang arena, Johnny. I've certainly and, done that in my and life. What I would what I would say, you might think it was embarrassing or goofy or silly. But but knowing a lot of scouts, knowing a lot of you know different people on the personnel side, 
The pro day circuit is sheer drudgery for those guys. They so that was it. something that just broke up the monotony, mm. cut the levity a little bit, you know, and was able to, to, to have a little fun. So good on you, Johnny. Uh, proud of you. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't guess it any other way from my, my guy, my partner in crime. Appreciate you, bud. So, hey, man. Heck yeah. It was fun, man. Um, so homie right there. I, I, one more thing on tight ends from me. Like I said, I'm in love with Ashton Genty, Coach Sanford, and I'm thinking, would a 12 or possibly 13 personnel, two or even three tight ends on the field, would, does, that, does that help if you have a running back like Genty? I mean, do, do, do I want to, uh, I mean, what uh, is, is that, I mean, if I'm going to be a power running team, talk about that a little bit. Ball, like game, how much- ball game, you're talking my language. Good. You are Good. You're, you're you are speaking. You're you're talking dirty in my left ear with a whisper, <laughs> brother. And and I think that that is the key because here's the deal: if you're a true spread offense, and that's you live in you know three by one, two by two spread sets with a tight end at times attached, a tight end at times unattached. If a defense decides to play cover one, single high safety, man coverage everywhere else they will have the ability every snap to play plus one box defense. So you're, you're at a disadvantage. Okay. So the disadvantage is you have to choose to either run the quarterback to get your numbers back to being fair. When you run your quarterback, you're reading one of those defensive players, whether it be a defensive end in the zone read game or the power read game. Sometimes it's a second level player when you're running some form of like misdirection, uh, you, you're reading it like a backside element. Wow. But okay. that's the way that you have to get your numbers back to being fair. Now, you have to then answer the question. If you're going to be a spread set, 11 personnel outfit at all times, do I want to run my quarterback in order to get my numbers fair to be able to run Ashton Genty? And I would say right now, if you're Boise State, and you have Maddox Madsen coming off in the injury, and and he's he's valuable, and then a, a young buck that that frankly probably needs a little bit more armor on his body. Mm-hmm. I would agree with that. Well, one of the alternatives that I believe gives you an advantage is to get a little medieval in the trenches, Johnny, mm. and do so with some some compact sets. Bring in extra tight end, wing, fullback. Utilize. You don't have to have a fullback position group. You have your tight ends trained as different entities in in the play. For example, I don't know if you remember Jake Hardy, the party back in 2014. He was a guy that was in the tight end group. I believe he was a walk-on when he came to Boise State, if I'm not mistaken. A lot of those guys have been historically. But he played the fullback position for us a lot, a lot of times. And, you know, he's a a dude that, hey, if, if I get 14 snaps a game, and I get to run through another man's face, I'll continue to do it for this program. And that's how hard he was for you? Yeah, that's Jay Cardi the party, man. And and I think that, that that's a way that not only you, – you could say that the answer defensively is, well, we're just going to load the box. Well, cool. You're going to load the box, but you're going to ask a lot of people that are playing a lot of spread systems to fit in run gaps that you just created by adding an extra element to this side, two out extra elements to this side. Oh, and by the way, the fullback in the backfield – he might create a gap if he goes to the right at the snap on the right side. He might create a new gap if he goes left on the on the snap to the left side. So it just it allows for if you want to get medieval, you have the ability to do so. Mm-hmm. And I don't think you necessarily always have to add, you know, defensive linemen or, you know, extra offensive linemen. I do think there's a place for that. I think that that will be part of what happens this year at Boise State, adding an extra O lineman. But I think you can do that by developing a confident group of tight ends that they might not get 60 snaps in a game, but man, they're excited for their their role. And then you empower different parts of your roster by giving them new roles. In your career, did you feel, can you remember, did you use more 12 and 13 personnel, the better running back you had? Yeah, it was uh, 2014, man. I mean, 2014, we based out of 11 personnel, but... You think about the, I mean, the long touchdown run. I think it was a 58, 60 yard touchdown run in the Fiesta Bowl. I think that put us up 28 7 or 21 0. What maybe. call was that? It was just, it was called uh, Fiesta. 
the play was called Fiesta. It was it was a personnel grouping. It was a formation. Um, but yeah, it was just us using an extra offensive lineman. I believe is three different tight end body types, rushing him onto the field and and running. You know, extra uh, basically call it. We called it pound. Pound was power with an extra with with an extra down blocker at the point of attack. I also wanted to talk transition to running backs a little bit. Speaking of Genty, coach, a um, couple of questions we'll get to real quick and. Um, then we'll get back to some Boise State stuff. But Kurt Blake, Coach Sanford, blitzing Jordan Love. That was laughable. You watched every single play from Green Bay versus Dallas. You probably put the all 22 on to cut, watch your boy too. Uh, what did Green Bay and Jordan Love do so well against Dallas where they couldn't blitz him? And Dallas was really good this year defensively. They did not expect to get shut down like that. Well, Jordan Love now, you know, he's had a chance to sit and marinate, you know, and, and learn the pro game, learn from Aaron Rodgers. And a lot of times as a quarterback, you know, you can make all the throws and a guy like Jordan Love trusts his athleticism to be able to get away from maybe an extra blitzer. But more than that, why not protect yourself when you see the pressure looks, lock down your tight end, lock down your running back. And then he made unbelievable back foot throws. That's one thing that, that Jordan Love has an uncanny ability to do that Patrick Mahomes has the ability to do is while retreating, maybe with a, an extra uh, unblocked blitzer that's in, it's, he's hunkering down on you. You be able, to, you're able to to unload a ball thirty plus yards down the field to maybe your cover zero answer, and and throw a perfect strike. And that's exactly what Jordan Love did in that game. He threw just some incredible back foot throws, which I'd say the majority of quarterbacks that I've coached in my career. I don't want them to attempt many back foot throws because oftentimes back foot throws, throwing off platform, retreating off balance, yeah. you know, the arm talent to make that, that gets a lot of action on the, on the, on the cursor in the quarterback room, yeah, huh? Throwing on the back of your and foot. It did with Jordan love until I realized that's one of his superpowers. Like that is, really? his, that is his x-ray vision as a, as an X-Men. Like he's one of those guys that had that, that superpower. And I had to change my rules coaching a guy like Jordan love. And so when I saw him make those throws off his back foot, I'm sitting there laughing. I'm like, for a second there, I tried to coach that out of him. And I'm like, you know what? And by a second, I mean more during spring ball. Uh, but when it got down to real games, we opened up at Wake Forest. And there were, I believe, I ended up a top 25 team. Some of the throws that he made off his back foot were, were second and none. I love it, man. Um, Jordan Love. We'll get to some more questions a little bit later. Until then, we have a mic drop in 90 seconds. You looking for a new job? Well, how about getting into the trucking industry? Our friends at Transportation Compliance Service can help you every step of the way, whether it's the big rig on your screen, the Amazon truck in your neighborhood, all the paperwork, all the things you need. Let them help you out. Transcomservice.com. They'll have you out there towing that first load in no time. Transcomservice.com. The pounds continue to fall off, and it's thanks to Dave and our friends over at Lean Feast. Check them out. Leanfeast.com slash Meridian. Full customizable meal prep. You want to go into the store, pick out your meals individually. That's great. It's right there on Eagle Road in Meridian. Or you can do it all online at leanfeast.com slash Meridian, and they'll deliver it to you. 208-487-5782. They're feeding the football team, the basketball team, Taylor Green, Ashton Genty, Tyson Degenhart, and more. Check them out. Lean Feast. Leanfeast.com slash Meridian. Still time to get that fall round of golf in, and you need to do it at Timberstone Golf Course out in Caldwell. Book a tee time at playtimberstone.com. The best greens in the valley, new technology, new golf carts, friendly environment, fun, challenging course. Check them out, Timberstone Golf Course. Book your tee time today, and I'll see you out there, playtimberstone.com. All right, ball I love, I love this. Before yeah. I get into ball talk here, Skyship 208. T Crow moving to full back in front of AJ two to run God's play. That's the that's the word. That's the rumor. If you look at the depth chart, um, I love that. Tyler rumor. Crow is listed as a fullback FB before he was listed as an HB. So uh, yeah, we'll talk about that. Big He's out that for rumor. spring ball. He's not right. playing in spring ball, right. but but the rumor is run. that Tyler yeah. Crow. They're going to have some type of fullback position for him. I think all we right. all know that, that old T. Crow is willing to run through another man's face against that man's will. He's uh, a beast. Ball, talk, ball talk time sponsored by the best, the venerable Bronco Brew Coffee. Go out and subscribe online at Bronco Brew Coffee. Look it up. Not only will you get the most elite, fresh, roasted, fresh ground beans, if that's what you choose, 
you can get it delivered anywhere in the United States. I have it delivered out here in Colorado, uh, weekly delivery. You can do it bi-weekly. You can do it monthly, but you're going to get outstanding coffee. And then you can go on their platform on their website and choose who you decide your NIL uh, contribution through Bronco Brew Coffee goes to. It can be to an athlete, it can be to an entire team. I know this uh, Boise State softball team is rolling right now. You can have NIL money go towards the softball program, but just go ahead and, and get on Bronco Brew Coffee's website and go ahead and subscribe and help out athletes and get yourself some tasty black cup of joe. Ball talk. We got the mic drop here, Johnny. Here's what it got. Spring ball. Spring football. Best time of the year. It's the best time of the year. It's a time as a coach where you have an opportunity to really sink into the fundamentals of playing the positions that you coach. As a coordinator, you have a chance to, to tinker with some new schemes, to teach some new players that are new faces to your program, different ways of doing things, whether they've been a, a portal entry uh, into your program. But spring ball is just a time where the pressure of, of having the actual game day is not a threat. It's not a threat whatsoever. And, and I love the season. Absolutely love the season. But in spring ball, you have the ability to have an entire day's worth of time to meet individually with players, watch extra film, go over the practice film, and develop really strong relationships. I also love to see in spring ball where your team goes from maybe a new kind of a skeleton crew of the year you had last year, some new pieces coming in, and you get to watch that come together practice after practice you stack good practices on top of one another and then you start seeing a team coming together you know a really good spring ball it starts with health you want to come out of spring ball healthier than you started spring football you want your your team to be hardened by the physicality that you created at practice but another part of a healthy spring football is that you want to come out knowing your identity who are you what are you going to be are you going to be the fastest paced tempo team in, in the college football? Are you going to be the physical team where the other team has to check themselves when they step foot off the bus and get into Albertson Stadium? Or are you going to be the team that likes to just mix it up and, and throw the football very efficiently on time, be surgical in how you go about your business, run the football into good looks? But the biggest thing is that you got to come out of spring ball knowing who you are. Same thing on the defensive side of the ball and special teams. You want to know exactly who you are and how your pieces are starting to come together to be what you are going to be in the fall. I love spring football. I miss it. I love the heck out of it. Uh, it was a time also where my family could come to practice. My kids could run around. I'd have a chance to see them after practice, maybe go grab dinner with them. You don't have that luxury in the fall. So spring football, I miss you. I love you. And I'll tell you what, I'm a little jealous right now. Well done, Coach. Well done on the mic drop. Quick follow-up question here. Let me get our uh, ball talk it, scenery back. Um, you were the backup quarterback at Boise State when I think three three consecutive years this offense led the nation in scoring. How aware was everybody of that? The players, Chris Peterson, your offensive coordinator, Dan Hawkins, your head coach, was that something you guys paid attention to week to week during a season? Not at all. And you got to think, Johnny, in 2001, 2002, in that era, there was no Twitter. <laughs> there was no None. real time updates. You used to have to go to the box score to check baseball scores when totally. you and I were, were young. Yeah, schools. it wasn't it wasn't where it is now. Not even close. This is 20 years ago. So I'll never forget. I had no idea. And I don't even know if anybody else in the quarterback room knew we were leading the nation in scoring, I think it was in 2001, maybe Chris Peterson's first year, maybe yeah. it was 02 with Dinwiddie. Um, but I don't think anybody knew it until after the year, probably a month after the season, after the bowl game, the NCAA or somebody from either NCAA or American football coaches association, I they, can't sent believe a plaque. It. they sent a plaque to Boise state with the statistical leader for scoring offense, the top scoring offense. And it had the number, and so that was, like, oh, wow, we led the nation in scoring. So that's how I found out. I had no idea. I mean, you know, and I think Boise State's always been a program. Uh, and I think this is a really good thing. I think this is one of the staples of who, you know, Dan Hawkins was. Certainly Chris Peterson was known for this about yeah. just not having your blinders on. 
and and not worrying about it back then with the press clippings. Remember, we used to have to, to clip yep. out the newspaper articles. We didn't even we didn't worry about the press clippings. We didn't watch the news. We didn't listen to Johnny Ball game and Prater. Nope. You guys weren't there on the radio space. I mean, who would have been back in the day? It was uh, it was Idaho uh, Sports Talk? It was know, still who there. Was, who, who was on air at the time? I think about early two thousands. It would have been Mike Prater and Jeff Caves. Remember oh, Caves? Yeah, and yeah, Prater. yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, go, but the Statesman uh, was massively powerful then, and oh, yeah. you know you had some big time you know, writers. Prater. Prater. Yeah, he had a dream team built there at the Statesman, and but yeah, that's where you went to get your Boise State news. You, you it wasn't on your phone constantly. That still surprises me, though. You guys didn't know throughout the season. Hey, we're leading the nation in points scored, but I, I mean, there really wasn't even. I mean, you could have went on the internet and sorted it yourself, but we didn't grow up doing that. So you really, it wasn't in your conscience. And I guess, like you're saying, you guys were just so focused. You were just worrying about kicking the crap out of the team you were going to play in a couple of days. Huh? The crazy, I mean, the crazy thing about it, Johnny, is that we were actually putting up half a hundred just about every outing, but yes. nobody talked about it. Nobody said a word about. There was no, you know, hashtag half a hundred. There was none of that stuff. You were just going out and delivering, man. How do you think that? How do you think Twitter or how do you think that would have made anything different? Like your era of Boise State as a player. In the world of social media, I, I mean, I, would it have made any difference? Um, yeah, I, I think it's made a lot of difference just from it's something that you have to talk to your players constantly about, uh, about not okay. listening to the outside noise. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, media people, we I can say that now. Yeah, right. we You're a big Colorado job. man, Colorado Avalanche playoffs push. You're in it. I'm, I'm, I'm listening to you. We have, we have a job to do. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the bottom line is that we are a conduit to be analysts of what's happening on the field to the public and the public yep. needs, you know, whether they like you, hate you or indifferent about you, that's what the media is there to do. And players have a job to do. Coaches have a job to do. And I think that's the biggest thing that I've learned um, from being on both sides now of it is you can't get, caught up in what's Johnny ball game saying about you. And nope. if you are, you're not going to be long for the sport. And frankly, if that's who you are as a coach and you're worried about what, what, what Mike Sanford's saying about you on ball talk, you got problems. You're not gonna be long for this industry. This industry is going to chew you up and spit you out. And particularly if you want to go coach in a big time program somewhere, and I'm talking like Notre Dame, uh, Alabama, you want to coach those types of places. If you think the Boise market to chew you up and spit you out, just wait till you go to one of those places. So you got to train yourself as a player or as a coach to be able to put those blinders on and not concern yourself with the opinions of either the people sitting in their basement tweeting out or the people <laughs> yeah. that have a microphone in front of their face. And you just got to be able to say, you know what? That's their job to do. They are from their perspective. They're analyzing what they say, what they, so what they're seeing for the people that want the analysis. And I think that's what's what I've learned from now being on both sides of it is that coaches have a job to do, players have a job to do, media has a job to do, fans have a job to do. And, I'm, and, I'm and not, honestly, when you were a player, you just didn't have near as many pitfalls there, right? I mean, Chris Peterson, Dan Hawkins, I mean, they were able to get through to you guys, eh? Totally, hundred yeah. percent. And, and what I would go even further to say about about that subject matter. Is I, I so I just started in tomorrow night. I have practice number two for the 14U softball team known as the Savages. Head ball, nice. coach, head ball coach Johnny, P daughter Peyton playing a little corner infield in the hot corners. First, you got to be excited to be coaching lefty again. You got practice lefty. planned, you got oh, practice planned, coach. You know, I do down to the minute. And we keep to it. I, hey, I run around a softball field with a Fox 40 whistle. And nobody, I mean, some crazy coach in a baseball softball environment. You guys are going to be good. Oh, we you're going to be good. You're going to get through to them. We'll I, hey, you know what? Bill, even if you even if you try to come to a game and you analyze and try to bring down some of my coaching decisions, you know what I'm going to say? That's what? Johnny's job. It's your job. I'm okay with that. It's his job. <laughs> you know, we doing. should ball talk or BNN. BJ and myself should fly out there and you know shoot a broadcast a game that you're coaching in. 
and oh, we'll talk to you. There will be a press conference following, and you better no hope question. that you win that game. Oh, Man, we will. Me, me and BJ asked some questions after a loss. We, we should probably set this up. No we got to get we got to get out of here in about ten minutes. Build. Let me, let me finish up my uh, my thought on the softball team. Boom. I first parents meeting when we, when we started this team six months ago, and we just finished. We, that was the fall season. We're starting the spring season. I have a great line, and it's this: players play, coaches coach, parents cheer. That's I it. Like it. That's it. Put that on now, a shirt. Okay. Hey, now I'll add to that. Players play, coaches coach, fans cheer, media spits hot garbage. That's just what we do. I just accept it. Accept it. It's our life. Media spits hot garbage. I put that on a t-shirt. It'll be selling out sandman.com. There's two mic drops today. What are you drinking there, man? Is that is that a beverage? What was that? Uh, it looks like a grapefruit soda. It's a spindrift, non-alcoholic, non-caloric. Nice, bro. Hey, build me a backfield, and then let's get out of here on ball talk. Boise State, that's another thing. Ashton Genty, we, we clearly know. Breezy Dubar had some run last year. Impressive at times. Caden Dudley, coach, he's getting a lot of run at practice. In fact, I've seen Caden Dudley at RB2 quite often. Um, and the youngest, the Sire Gaines kid, he should still be in high school. He was the early signing coach. He looks like he's 23, like he's built. He showed up kind of like Genty did like, Whoa, okay. That, that kid should be in high school right now. How do you, I mean, you've, you've built backfields before at, at major levels of football. Uh, how, what's the best way? It doesn't have to be this backfield specifically, even though I know, you know, some of these players just. What are the philosophies building a backfield, a running back room? Well, as a running back coach at Stanford, 11 and 12, uh, we had a, a mantra in our running back room um, that we were backs on backs on backs, racks on racks on racks. Like that's what we believed that everybody in that room on scholarship or walk on had the ability to be a starting running back for this team and train themselves to be a starting running back for this team. And I think that we ended up playing a game where we had three backs against University of Washington. That they were top 10. Sark was there. Okay. Three different backs went over 100 yards in a game. And then the Damn. fourth one, I think, had 89. So we nearly had four 100-yard rushers. Wow. 444 That's total like yards Tom rushing. Osborne, Nebraska, on their best day. And it was the perfect example to cite that our depth was our, was, was our benefit. It was our value. Now, when you look at the actual perfect construct of a roster, I always think that you you always want a bell cow. You want you want AJ too. You want the guy that games on the line. That guy's getting the football, no questions asked. And you also want a guy that is going to get into the rhythm of how those particular runs against that particular defensive look and or defensive strength and skill how those runs are going to fit. How, where the holes are going to be, and that plays out sometimes after five, six, up to 12, 15 carries. Stanford, we used to talk about, it's like early on in the game, just body shots, body shots, body shots, body shots. Eventually, you're going to find that chin, you're going to knock them out. That was that's how we built it. So you always want a bell cow at one. Okay, at two, you want you want a guy that's a, that's a secret weapon. You want the guy that you can use in the screen game, you can use in the passing game that you can use in the movement game. You can get him motioning out to empty. He's a good receiver. He's a good fly sweep type runner. He compliments the one guy when you have both guys on the field. I think that's the perfect role for a guy like Breezy Dubar. I've even heard the term, Harsh used to call it uh, the duck. You want a guy that's the duck, like the What's Oregon duck. Like the, the, uh, what was the guy's name back at Oregon that was super fast? Um, oh, uh, yeah, yeah LaMichael James. Before, after him. Uh, soup like crazy four two type speed. Uh, uh, the the, the, the D'Anthony Thomas. D, D, yeah, you wanted that guy. The duck is D'Anthony Thomas. Okay. Then the third guy, you want to mirror your first guy. You know, so if you're looking at the construct of this backfield right now, you've got AJ two bell cow. You got your your RB two is kind of your fun weapon guy, your duck, and that's going to be a guy like Breezy Dubar, and then your three. 
who you mentioned. Give me his name one more time. I'm drawing Caden a Dudley. Caden, Caden Dudley. Dudley. Who was a re- he was a return man used in in the return game, used sporadically, you know, late in games. You want that guy to be stylistically more like your one, m- most likely a heavier, lower body type individual that can can carry the weight if if indeed something does happen to your one because you want your three. If one is either tired, I always say if he breaks his shoelace, you want to just throw your three at one and then your two stays in that same kind of weapon type role. Interesting. And then behind that, I mean, what what about RB4? I mean, no role, just be ready to come no, in. I, and- I, I think in, like an RB4, if they have a really unique skill set, I love when my RB4 is my best pass protector and you got a guy that you could use on third down, ideally a guy that, you know, is going to stonewall blitzers, knows the protections, has intellect. I think that's a guy like what has been Tyler Crow historically. He'd be a really good RB4. And sometimes those RB4s can can really earn the respect of their teammates. And ultimately, you'll have offensive linemen because they do the dirty work. You'll have offensive linemen come up to the coordinator and ask for a few touches for RB4. Now, at Boise State, you know, and, and look at the – was it Boise? Boise says, sounds a lot like A.J. and the uh, – Ajayi and the McWeapon. Was that in your head at all on that? I mean, is that how you – how did you build your 2014 Boise State backfield the one year you were here? You had the bell cow, obviously, and uh, Jay. You guys lifted the red shirt. This was before you got to play games. Man, it was like still we, red shirt. Yeah, it was, uh, when we started really using – uh, Jeremy McWeapon McNichols, one of my favorite dudes and favorite Just players. Just got signed today by the Commanders, by the Let's way. Let's go. Let's go. Mander ball. Playing. He's going to be, he's gonna be a Mander. Keep getting that check there, J-Mac. But uh, yeah, Absolutely. I think was, you know, that was that was a situation where we didn't really necessarily clearly have that number two, uh, that, you know, that guy that you can use as a weapon. You know, at Stanford, it was Stephon Taylor was the clear-cut one, and then Tyler Gaffney was that number two, that – guy that could do all the funky things out of the backfield, caught the ball extremely well. You know, at Notre Dame, it was Josh Adams as our bell cow one. And then yep. CJ Procise was kind of that two. It was a converted receiver to running back. So you see it come all different types of ways. Your, your 2014 team, by the way, and you're spot on with that. And, and you had a quarterback who happened to rush for about 600 yards. That was nice with Grant. I mean, you were able to factor him as part of this massive running game. And another thing I will give you credit for, and I didn't see this after you left. I don't think it was because he was a senior, but maybe he was. But you gave the ball to Shane Williams Rhodes 15 times from scrimmage coach, and he got a buck 79, 12 yards per touch just on the Mike Sanford fly sweep special with a guy like Shane Williams Rhodes. I mean, Devin Demas. A little bit. He had 25 carries. McNichols, 32. But yeah, you know, there you go with the, yeah, that that running back. Or I'm sorry, that running game. I didn't really factor in how much you used, obviously, the quarterback, but also SWR, man. The, the wild thing, the wild thing, if you think about this, is that SWRs, those carries, none of those were the fly sweep because our, our all every single one of our fly sweeps was a forward chest pass that caught as that counted statistically as a reception. So all 12 of those would have been some form of a reverse or end around or something where it it, it involves some type 15, of misdirection. 15. You gave Everyone. him 15 carries. That might have, yeah, I mean, that's a of lot of fly sweeps. If you included the fly sweeps into that, I think you're looking more at like 30. So your fly sweeps were catches. You did the whole Andy Reid Mahomes thing. Dude, yep. just going to yep. hand it to you. I love because yeah, fantasy owners appreciate that. 100%. We really do because we need the point for the catch. Yep. Big time. All right, coach. I'm going to let you get to your Giants Dodgers. I got to throw my Mariners well. on. Not going well. That's up here right now. Like I said, the Dodgers, they paid so much. So, yeah, they're going to, they're just going to beat everybody. That so was so funny games. where that, that Vandal guy who chimes in here, he's a Dodger fan. And you were like, that says so <laughs> much. <laughs> Oh man. This makes sense, doesn't it? All right. Well, it all adds up, doesn't it, Johnny? I I think we're coming back Sunday or we'll we'll keep everybody posted. Sunday's good. I just, uh, you know, it was the Lord's Day, you know, and I, uh, you know, I wanted to, I don't know if there was enough air to take up the Lord plus Johnny and Mike Sanford on the same day. Wanted to give people, yep, give people a little break and uh, celebrate with their family and happy Easter Sunday a little late in advance, but happy Easter. I appreciate you, coach. Well done. Episode 
three. Spring edition, baby. As All in right. Caitlin Clark, who had, what, nine of these bad boys tonight? Something like that. Oh, Unbelievable. All right. Ball game in this 